light of Christ.
celebrate with all living creatures today. Help us to see your presence not only in human history, but also in the stories of our kin and creation. Teach us to hear the good news of God's loving care bringing through the creatures of the wild. Rejoice with us as we behold the mysteries of your wisdom implanted in all life. In the name of Christ, who fills heaven and earth, and whose words we speak as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I have a story about a kangaroo. Which I kind of think us, teaches us um, a little bit what God's love is like. Is there any chance somebody wants to sit and read it with you? Are you going to stop bouncing?
In our tradition, we have a prayer of confession, um, usually during Lent and Advent, but I decided to add one in for this season of creation, so let us come together as we pray our prayer of confession. Creating God, we remember those who are kin who are endangered, those who have had their homes destroyed, and those who have become extinct through human greed and exploitation. We feel the loss, we share the sorrow, we share the memory, and we are sorrow. Job 39, 1 to 17, 26 to 30. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the number of months that they fulfill? Or do you know the time they give birth? When they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of the youth? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go forth and do not return to them. Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass to which I have given the step for its own? 
the salt land for its dwelling place. It scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shouts of the driver. It ranges the mountains as its pasture, and it searches after every green thing. It is a wild ox willing to serve you. Will it spend the night in your crib? Can it tie the furrows with rope? Or will it harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on it because its strength is great? Or will you lend a hand over your labor to it? Do you have faith in it that it will return and bring your grain to your thrashing floor? The ostrich's wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage, for it leaves its eggs on the earth and lets them be warm on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them or a wild animal may, animal may trample them. It deals cruelly with its young, as they were not of its own. Though its labor should be in vain, yet it has no fear, because God has made it forget wisdom and give it no share of understanding. It is in your wisdom that the hawk soars and spreads its wings towards the south. Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes its nest on high? It lives on the rock and makes it home in the fatness of the rocky crag. For there it spies its prey. Its eyes see it from far away. Its young ones suck up blood. And where the slain are, there it is.
the secular world tells us to rely on material things. We are unsure of government policies and where they may lead, but this scripture outlines what truly matters, taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. He said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouses nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep seeking what you are to eat and what you are to drink. And do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that seek all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Here in his wisdom, thanks be to God. The scripture this morning contains the beloved phrase, consider the lilies of the field. It has been well worn in sermons, in diatribes and lectures about what should be central in our lives and what truly matters, simply trusting in God. It has been the premise of a movie and the title of a book based on that scripture, I figured there were three ways I could go about the sermon. The first is I would suggest that we cancel the sermon altogether, and I send you outside to enjoy the glories of nature, to become up close and personal with flowers, to in effect consider the lilies in the field. But if I tried that route, some might believe I was shirking my duties as minister and not earning my pay. And judging from the number of mosquito bites I got when cutting those wildflowers this morning, I don't think we want to dwell outside. So we'll try one of the other two ways that are left to us. One of which is through the words, the sermon, the words of the poet, and in our imagination, we immerse ourselves in nature. It's a perfect topic for the days of summer and autumn. There should be time for drives through the countryside, hikes along a trail, visits to a, a petting farm or a country market. These are the days to celebrate the amazing creatures of God's creation. You can see the sheep in the pasture field, newly shorn for their wool. You can see a beef herd of cattle with calves following their mothers. And if we are indeed lucky, we may see a great blue heron take flight or glimpse a snow white egret. And in the early morning or sometime in the evening, maybe you may hear the grumpy croak of a bullfrog or the keening pipe song of peepers. And then there is the constant chirping of birds in the early morning before the heat of the day silences them. A 
hogging of geese taking flight from a pond, the cantankerous call of a crow. We can actually take time to smell the roses or perhaps the faint aroma of apples fallen ripe from the tree, the scent of the lily of the valley planted in our flower gardens, the wonder of the wildflowers that really shouldn't be growing in my garden but are. There was a hymn I recently discovered that celebrates all of creation, so I wanted to share the words with you. They call it the Song of the Wild. Will you come back with me to the birth of the earth, where for all its life form evolved? We will sing with the heavens, amazed at the sight, a planet with secrets to unfold. Will you walk home with me on the way to the wild and watch baby birds break from their shells? Do you know how God serves as a midwife to all? the lion, the lizard, and gazelle. Will you gather with me as the wedding birds dance, prepare to migrate, preparing to migrate north once more? Can you fathom the code God has fixed in their souls to navigate oceans when they roar? Will you sleep with your God in the desert one night and wait with the creatures of the sand? Can you fathom the wisdom instilled in their mind to live with a water, sun, or man? If you don't feel at home with rainforest snakes, if you're troubled when creatures change their skin, then surrender the claim that you rule on this earth and discover creation as your kin. Will you praise, be amazed with eyes wide as a child you praise, be amazed, and sing this song of the wild. A third way of considering the impact of the scripture reading this morning is to consider it as a challenge to simply trust in God. There's an old hymn that sings, trust and obey, trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Or if you prefer the more contemporary song, uh, don't worry, be happy. Um, I forgot my speakers where I could play it for you. Anybody, anybody able to listen? <laughs> oh no, very <laughs> Apparently I can't listen this morning, but I can't listen most of the days. Anybody who knows it, you know? Here's the little song I wrote. You might want to say no for no. Don't worry. Be happy. It was everywhere when it first came out, so. Anyway. My grandmother used to say that to worry was a colossal waste of time. She said she would never sit up at night waiting for a child to come home. For what could she do? She could be in bed and they would be wherever they were, so what would be the point in worrying? So she said. But there was that night when her eldest son, my father, did not come home when he was expected. He was working at the back of the farm plowing the land, a farm that was crisscrossed by deep drainage ditches. About midnight, the only explanation I have is that she decided to worry. She came next door to where my mother was, concerned that her son was not home yet. She suggested that they should go on a field trip to discover what had happened to him. She worried that perhaps he was in the bottom of one of those drainage ditches with a tractor on top and he needed rescuing. Although if he's underneath the tractor, I'm not sure rescuing could happen. So bundled up, about to set off on the mission of mercy, they encountered the tractor coming back in the laneway as my father arrived home while they were about to pull out. You probably don't really need to hear, but can perhaps imagine the lecture that she gave. Not that she'd been worried, of course, but he should have been home earlier. 
It just illustrates how difficult it is to not worry. Life gives us stresses and strains, and it's not always a simple matter to trust that all will be well, that all within God's grace will be well. Because further, you're not going to worry, but worry you likely will. But our faith requires of us that we at least try to trust. Try to trust that God will provide for all that we need. So I have stories from my grandparents on my mother's side of such extraordinary faith. My grandfather was a United Church minister and ministering in small rural congregations in southwestern Ontario. At that time, and I assure you it's not quite so true now, but at that time ministers had a meager salary. I think perhaps that they were expected to live solely on the grace of God. My grandfather and grandmother had four children, and although they got to live in manses free of charge, there still wasn't a lot of money to go around for everyday living. Yet one of the responsibilities of faithful living that they fully understood and undertook each month was that when the salary received, um, by the way, I have to tell you this, at one of their pastoral charges, there was a treasurer who delighted to say to my grandfather, who had had to ask for a salary because it was two weeks late already, the treasurer would say, well, pastor, giving this week wasn't that great, but I guess I can cover your salary. And from his pocket, he would draw out a lot of bills and watching my grandfather carefully count them out one by one until the stipend he was to receive had been covered. Every month when my grandfather received the salary, the first thing my grandparents did was to sit at the table, cash in hand with the church envelopes, and take out a tenth of that salary and fill in the envelopes for Sunday giving for the month. We don't preach a lot about tithing in our United Church these days. Maybe we can argue about whether it's a, a tithe of our net income or a gross income or whether it's a tithe of what we receive before or after we pay our bills, our, our housing, our rent on the farmlands, or whatever expenses we may have. But for them, it was a simple act of trusting that God would provide enough. And the act of tithing was a living out of that trust in God. And there's another story of my grandparents. My grandmother had rheumatoid arthritis and was badly crippled and lived every day in pain. Going up and down stairs was an excruciating act and the manse where they lived had stairs. Then there came a time in grandpa's career when he felt it was time to move. He lived by the old Methodist edict that one moved every five years as a minister, and it was time, well, more than time, it had been six years. So he took the call, sight unseen, to a new pastor church in a conference that they didn't know. When they checked it out, they discovered that it was a new fence, and everything had been built on one floor. It was a miracle gift to my grandmother. This absolute trust that God would provide came from my grandparents. They could live it. I wish I could. I try, but I don't necessarily do it very well. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, and yet God feeds them. And how much more value are you than the birds? Consider the lilies, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. Thanks be to God. And we can sing about trusting God when we sing, if you will trust in God, which is number, 
I have no idea. 
Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you, Edmund. abundance of creation. The gifts we gave as our offering this morning are a testimony of our thanksgiving and praise for this world we live in. Thanks be given to the Creator as our morning offering is received. God, 
source of everything that is. We bring before you our prayers for this day. As we join with all creation to say, thank you, God, thank you. Thank you for joining the web of creation, for living and dying among us, to redeem us and all creation. Thank you for rising to life, permeating creation with your spirit to sustain and heal all things. With voices of thanks echoing through the cosmos, from the first day of creation until this very moment in time, we praise and thank you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God of all life, the universe is filled with your presence. Creating one, we give thanks for your presence in this community, for the life we share together, for the joys we have known. We give thanks for the week that has passed, that we have traveled safely together to this time and moment. Bless the community this day. We pray, God, for this world, for the people of Morocco, for the people of the Northwest Territories, for the citizens of Yellow Life as they try to reclaim their homes, for the people of BC contending with wildfires and floods, Beyond these borders, we pray for the people in Greece, in the Ukraine, in Italy. We pray for the world leaders to have some wisdom and common sense as they meet. For all the places in Europe that need your strength and courage. In our homes and communities, we pray for a blessing of healing. And then to those in particular need, Blake, Jeff, Morley, Mike, Bob, Joyce, Lorraine, Jennifer, Jean, Dorothy, Marge, and Lori's family. Enfold us all in your love and help us to trust in your care. In the name of the one we follow, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. And we can continue to celebrate creation as you sing hymn number 30 for more voices, it's a song of praise to the Maker.
Christ calls us to be his disciples, to serve him with love and compassion, to serve earth by caring for creation and all creatures in danger or need. May the Spirit of God, who is above all and in all and through all, fill you with the knowledge of God's wisdom. And may the grace of God, deeper than our imagination, the strength of Christ stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, which in our togetherness, guide and sustain us today and in all our tomorrows. Amen. Amen.